the degree to which the dominant firms in an industry invest in intangibles, and in particular, proprietary information technology, the rate of growth of productive firms in that same industry is slower. Now, why does that happen? I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. One of the big questions in our economy, and therefore our society, is why productivity growth has slowed. In his new book, The New Goliath, How Corporations Use Software to Dominate Industries, Kill Innovation, and Undermine Regulation, James Besson, the Executive Director of the Technology and Policy Research Initiative at the Boston University School of Law, argues that the problem is really that big companies increasingly are able to dominate by mastering software. And software broadly defined, software is the intersection between technology and data. And so his argument is that productivity growth has slowed for for, for that reason, not because fewer productive firms are being created, not because M&A is enabling big firms to to buy small firms and take them off the market. The rate at which dominant firms have acquired other companies has actually declined since the late late 1990s, but rather because of this this mastery essentially of the intersection of software of software and data. And he argues, which is makes his his book right up Luigi and my alley, he argues that this mastery of software by major corporations helps explain rising economic concentration, increasing inequality and slowing innovation. So it has very big societal consequences. I want to add a factoid because you said very, very well about the, the productivity slowdown. He has a number that I would like our listeners to keep in mind because it's quite stark. And he said that the labor productivity growth, so how much more each worker produces every year, went from 2.7% in the years from 2000 to 2007 to 1.4% per year ever since. And the difference is enormous because if you grow your productivity at 2.7 per year, you double what you produce every 25 years. So every generation sees that a double in production. If you grow at 1.4, it takes 50 years to double the production. So it takes two generations to achieve the same goal. There were a couple of other pieces of data that he had in his book that I also thought point to point help help clarify his argument. He points out that the total investment in proprietary software grew 74 percent to 239 billion over the decade that ended in 2019, and that the, the big companies are increasingly using this to manage complexity and gain competitive advantage. He had another number in here that, uh, as we know, and as we've had people on this podcast talking about how inc- investment in all types of intangibles have increased substantially. But he pointed out that that the stock of, of companies who have developed their own software increased eightfold for the top four firms, clearly outstripping the rest, and that the investments in the software by the top four firms even doubled relative to the mean investments made by second tier firms ranked fifth through eighth. And so this investment in own, what he calls own developed software, this proprietary software is, is dominated by, by, by large firms. And I thought those though that was another piece of data that that, that helped point out what he's getting at. So we thought we would have James Besson on our podcast to help explain his ideas. Old organizations find it difficult to adapt is the history of evolution to some extent. It is natural and we regard it as healthy that young disruptors eat their lunch because the fact they eat their lunch means that higher productivity will trickle down throughout the economy, will bring progress to all of us. But you notice that now this relationship has changed in the last 20 or 30 years and has changed in a way that I find it very different than what I, the other story I heard, so I find it particularly intriguing, which is uh, now the superstar firms are defending themselves through a mode of complexity that makes it difficult for others to adopt. But I maybe I'm, I'm butchering it. Why don't you give your, your better, best explanation of why, because I think that this is a fundamental question, why productivity has slowed down so much, in spite of the fact that we all see a lot of technology coming about, but what, what is causing that in your view? 
Right. My, my explanation for this is tied to the technology, and we've, we've got some evidence that the degree to which the dominant firms in an industry invest in intangibles, and in particular proprietary information technology, the rate of growth of productive firms in that same industry is slower. Now, why does that happen? I think it goes along with an understanding of, of how these firms grew and the nature of the complexity of their technology. So, so the, the problem we're facing today is that we're dealing with these very large systems that it appears aren't diffusing. You know, this very complex software, organizations that are built around that software, which are often very complex themselves, data, it seems to be very hard for firms to pose an, an effective alternative. You don't see the kind of spin-outs that you see in tech, typical technology industries where, you know, executives from Fairchild leave and start other semiconductor companies. It's just become very difficult for the technology to diffuse. And in that case, the property rights are not necessarily helpful, particularly as the pendulum has been to going towards greater and greater restrictions on employee knowledge. So we have non-compete laws, we have strengthening of trade secret law. All of that limits the ability of employees to go and uh, take what knowledge they've learned, often not patented knowledge, and use it elsewhere. Uh, it slows the diffusion process down. Um, when you get a situation where there's such a gap between the leaders in the industry and, and, and their technology and the, the, the follow-on firms and their technology, that's an indication that the balance that's implicit in intellectual property law uh, is out of whack. It's out of balance, uh, and I'm suggesting we restore some of that balance. Is it possible to do that? What I took away from what you wrote is that this was always almost an implicit arrangement, that this diffusion took place and the processes which enabled it were, were implicit. And now we have to take what was implicit and somehow make it explicit by putting in place new new laws, new requirements. And given that the process the process by which it happened was diffuse and implicit, how, how do you how do you make that explicit? Well, so part of that is explicit. To, I mean, part of the stuff I'm talking about is explicit, but you're, you're right. There's a there's a lot that's very informal, and the diffusion has never been something that's been, uh, you know, very clearly delineated how it happens and, and what encourages it. Part One of the reasons it worked well in the past is that there are benefits to firms to spread their technology via license. So, general, you know, when General Motors licensed its technology to the Ford Lincoln division, Yes, GM would lose some sales to, to Lincoln, but the overall size of the market would grow so much that it was nevertheless beneficial to them, and they made money from their licenses. We see something similar like that happening with Amazon's AWS. You know, so they had a proprietary technology. They understood it was a source of competitive advantage. They had these huge web websites that had to process an enormous number of transactions and it had to do it very quickly. The slower it went, the less well it worked. You know, so they developed some tremendous capabilities to do that, and they realized this is a source of competitive advantage. And rather than keep it locked up or entirely locked up, they opened it up. And that turned out to be a tremendous benefit. Lots of small companies, as well as companies like Target or whatever, uh, use their facilities, use their expertise. Amazon, of course, got paid. They made a they're making, still making a ton of money from it. They have some, some competition now, but, you know, it turned out to be a very profitable thing. So I think ultimately one of the biggest factors is to what extent can uh, firms be encouraged or in some cases compelled to unbundle, to open up. And I, I think that may be the biggest, uh, the, the biggest policy challenge. There are opportunities out there where if they open up like that, they can make tremendous profits. But I think it's often very hard for ma managers to see that, it's very risky. Government can and has in the past played a role. So I think, you know, one of the best examples is the IBM unbundling, where the threat of government antitrust activity nudged IBM to, uh, to, to sell its software separately from its hardware and allow other people's hardware software to run on their hardware. You're basing it on a bet that, that a market will emerge that's, that's very large. And it's very, it's often very hard to know. As it turned out, they, they did it. They were nudged by the government to, you know, just cross over that line and did it. 
And it turned out to be hugely profitable to IBM. So they gave up part of their software business, but they gained uh, you know, a tremendous amount of uh, business overall. Talk a little bit more about the role that complexity plays. I thought about your, your work as almost a Venn diagram between software development and complexity, and where we end up with a real problem is where software and, the, and, and complexity overlap in that, in that space. Yes, yeah, so, well, I think the key thing is that software enables co- firms to manage complexity. So the economics of software is, you know, what, once you've written the code, you can reproduce copies almost costlessly. Uh, so there are economies of scale. But I, there's something else here, which is that modular software is extensible, meaning it can add features it can add relatively costlessly. It can add features, it can add functions, it can add greater variety. So when you, your automobile is based on software, it can have many more features and much greater control than in a traditional mechanical or mechanical or electrical system. So as effectively, software lowers the cost of having a more complex system. Complexity then has this, this added feature that it, it's difficult, it makes it difficult to copy or to imitate or to come up and challenge. Let me try a slightly different interpretation and feel free to say it's completely wrong because I just made it up, so it m- must be wrong. <laughs> but the reason why we've seen sort of the, the watermark of this world succeeding is also because the seers of this world were inefficient, bureaucratic, uh, not very adaptable. So imagine that maybe with all that teaching of business school about improving the organization, etc., we made the existing organization more adaptable, more responsive, faster in seeing the new technology and adopting it. After all, when we saw Snapchat cam- coming in with a new feature, Facebook had copied the next day, and, and so on and so forth. So Existing organizations are much faster in adopting. That will explain why we don't see the young firm growing. What will not explain is why don't we see actually higher growth overall? Because in in the Facebook, we saw like Instagram copying TikTok and getting a lot of the feature that was in TikTok immediately. All the customers get the same benefit instantaneously. So that will not explain the slowdown in productivity growth. You know, the, 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 the largest firms are, they're not seeing an acceleration in productivity growth, but they're seeing sustained productivity growth. The slowdown is, is coming with, with the smaller firms that can't challenge. Now, is it a story that those smaller firms are having their ideas stolen? And I, for one, I don't think uh, that happens as easily in all areas of technology as it did with Instagram. Uh, you know, it's very clear that you see some companies that, small and medium-sized companies that they have patent protection. They have other things that enable them to keep some sort of advantage, but they're just not growing. So, I, I, I mean, I guess that's really an empirical question at this point as to how much the large firms are able to take over technologies developed by, by others. So one of the things I found most interesting about your, your work is the, the far-reaching nature of many of, of the implications. And so on one level, you can see this as a book about a change in, in, in the economy and the rise of technology that can shut down innovation. But on another level, it's about a very profound change in our societal structure. And it does raise all these other interesting questions. So maybe talk a little bit about that. What worries you the most about what you found and what you see? It, you know, this is very tricky because... In a sense, the, 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 the problem is arising because these companies are doing, they're benefiting society definitely in the short run. It also poses uh, a problem for regulation that a software-based economy is increasingly difficult for government regulators to manage, to handle. Regulation has turned increasingly dependent on information. And yet software-based economy means there are ample opportunities for information to be distorted. So I, I give a couple examples. Uh, the uh, Volkswagen, well, it wasn't just Volkswagen. There were a dozen companies faking the emissions on diesel cars. And, and this, this was done over many years. But, what ha- well, you know, you, if you took your Volkswagen into uh, for the emissions testing where the EPA rates it and, and, and European regulators as well, uh, they had various ways of detecting whether you were doing an emissions test or not. And if you were in an emissions test, they would make the emissions nice and low. But once they figured, once the software figured out that you were no, you're on the open road, they boosted the emissions 20 times. So it was belching out 
you know, serious pollutants, they're able to use software to uh, obscure the nature of what's being regulated. A, a bigger problem is probably the 2008 financial collapse where software wasn't the only thing going on, but, you know, you had these financial instruments, increasingly complex, that could only be managed with software systems, very opaque for someone to understand what's really at risk. You know, to alleviate that problem, they were rated by the ratings agency who used software models to rate them. But it turns out that financial institutions could pretty quickly learn how to game those ratings. And then you had the banks buying up this stuff who used financial risk models, software models, again, that were also opaque, you know, to evaluate their own risk. And it became, you know, a situation where nobody really knew what the level of risk was. So it, 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 the obscurity that came with software effectively made a significant part of the financial system unmanageable. You emphasize a lot the software part and not a lot the data part. But at the end of the day, the data are very important. And I expected, actually, by the end of the, your book, I was expecting a call for sharing data ownership. Wouldn't that be a solution? Yeah, uh, okay. I, I, this is my fault, I think, for the words I use. When I'm talking about proprietary software systems, that's a combination of software and data and organization, all three. And so data is part of that. And um, I thought I did in the book talk about the importance of uh, sharing of data. No, sorry, you, you do. I, to, to be, you do. But you don't go as far as saying maybe the data should be automatically shared after six months. No? After all, Google and, and Facebook are telling us that after six months, the data is useless. If that's true, uh, why don't they share publicly? Yeah, so one of the problems about talking about regulation of data is it's far more complex than it seems. That I think it has to be industry specific. Sharing data for social media uh, for six months might make an awful lot of sense. But again, what you mean by data is, is fairly tricky. The Facebook case, for instance, you know, if I like something uh, that's connected to all these sorts of different data uh, in terms of who my friends are, what they're doing, you, you know, what the, the information about them is. So it's not uh, a simple thing of, oh, yeah, you want our data, we'll send you a disk. It, it's far more complex. I, I, I don't pretend to, to have the answers on that. So I, I left it fairly open. I, I think on most of this, and where I recommend policy, all I can feel confident in recommending is broad general directions. But certainly, I think opening data is, is part of it. It's also true that, you know, what makes these systems proprietary may be one piece or another. So in some cases, the software may even be open source, which is true of some of the AI software, for instance. But it's the data that makes it proprietary, or it's the organization that makes it proprietary. And so in other cases, there's proprietary software, and the data is publicly available data. So, you know, absolutely... Uh, data is part of the equation here. Just how exactly we deal with that, how exactly we deal with sharing of software and the information about software. These are difficult questions and they're going to take us years to figure out. One last question. I feel that it is important to understand also the influence that large organizations have through grants and, and, and funding of research. And uh, I've, saw, I've seen, and kudos to you, that you disclose that your research has been funded by Google and Koch uh, Foundation and so on and so forth. To what extent do you think that this has impacted or not impacted your research? Uh, well, I don't think it's impacted our research significantly. I, th I think some of our funders may not be too pleased with where I've gone with some of the research, as a matter of fact. I have one funder who doesn't talk to me anymore. <laughs> that, that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's always a risk. Uh, we, we took the gamble that we could take the funding and not get overly influenced. The, the funding doesn't come with any strings directly attached to it. Uh, and I think it's tended to be more a matter of we're doing the kinds of research that organizations like, and therefore they fund us more. But uh, it, it's, it's a valid concern. It's a valid question. I, I, don't, I think it's a, different researchers have to answer it differently. I, I don't think the answer is necessarily to forego funding from anybody who, can, who might be questionable. And, and, and the reality is even the, you know, the, the well-known seemingly independent f foundations 
they have agendas and they have outlooks that may tend to mean that they fund certain sorts of work uh, rather than others. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you answering this question. If you're enjoying the discussions Luigi and I have on this show, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show you should check out. It's called Entitled. International lawyers Claudia Flores and Tom Ginsburg have traveled the world, getting into the weeds of global human rights debates. On Entitled, they use their expertise to explore the stories and the thorny questions around why rights matter and what's the matter with rights. Subscribe to Entitled, part of the award-winning University of Chicago Podcast Network. This is where, in my view, he falls a bit short. I was trying to push him. But my view is that his reasoning leads to much more aggressive implication. It says the, the IBM example is actually pretty strong because IBM was forced by an antitrust suit to unbundle the software and the hardware. And of course, there are a bunch of economists that whenever somebody forces, uh, when the government forces uh, a company to do something, and exposed them now to be the right thing to do, they say, oh, but we were about to do anyway, okay? It turns out that he cites enough sources that uh, that was not the case. But in spite of that, he ends up saying, we should nudge companies to do that. I don't think you should nudge it. You should force the, the hell out of them. In a sense, there, there are two beautiful examples that where antitrust spur innovation. Number one is the famous case about the forced licenses of the transistor, the FTC, I think, forced uh, AT&T to license the transistor to everybody. And that's really spur the computer industry as we know. That's one case. And the second one is this one of IBM that uh, forced the unbundling of hardware and software. And that is what led to the explosion of software and basically the ability to have even the personal computer industry. I think that without that require unbundling or push unbundling, this would not have happened or would have happened many, many years later. So his defense is uh, if IBM sees that was in its advantage, they would have done it. So I'm trying to push to make sure that IBM sees that it is in its advantage. However, in the book is very clear, this is in your advantage only if the dramatic reduction in prices will lead to such a high increase in demand that you can make more profits by taking a small slice of a much bigger pie than a big slice of a small pie. And this is really depending very heavily on the elasticity of demand to prices in that particular sector, which might be true, might not be true. I don't think it's necessarily the case that this will necessarily happen. So if that's an incentive of companies, great we should let companies know, and maybe in business school, we should teach them to do so. But what about the cases in which it's not in their interest to do so? And in those cases, I think you should intervene, and that's what antitrust is about. So that, that's uh, problem number one. Problem number two, I think, is way too kind with platforms. When Amazon Web Services is opening up to everybody, or when Amazon Marketplace is opening up to everybody, there is a transition phase in which everybody is going to benefit, there is an ultimate phase in which we all depend on Amazon for everything, and they're going to extract a lot of surplus out of us. Ignoring that eventually this is going to be the end is like jumping from the 50th floor and say the, four, the first 49th floor are great, and I ignore the last. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm a little bit too harsh, but I have to say I'm harsh because I love his, his book. I think he's very insightful, very novel. In my view, he doesn't want to push it as hard as he could. I don't disagree with that, but I guess I have a lot more understanding of why he wouldn't want to push it as hard than, than, perhaps, than perhaps you do based, based on where you're coming from. And I think one is that he didn't begin as a critic of software. So for him to take on the industry in this way was already a fair amount of, of movement and a very intellectually honest movement. And he wasn't coming at this from the standpoint of somebody who, who thought something needed to be done differently. He was coming at this as someone who was looking to explain a problem and found a really novel and intellectual honest way of, of explaining a problem. And I do, I think his diagnosis is more compelling than his, than his solutions, but, but, I'm, but, I'm, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> I don't think that takes away from the, from the strength of the diagnosis. The other 
part of the problem, I, I think, is that it doesn't, his diagnosis doesn't lend itself to any kind of easy solution in the sense that the issue can be different in any given industry. And I thought that was among the most compelling of his points, that in one industry, it might be the, da- the control of the data. In another, it might be the control of the, of the software. But so this doesn't lend itself to a prescriptive antitrust policy as much as it does a very nuanced case by case, what's the issue in this, in this particular industry? Industry. What are we trying to solve? What What is the core thing that is enabling this cementing of power? Because it might be different from, from one industry to another, and therefore the solution has to be very, very, very tailored. And you can bet in our, in our day and age where corporations have so much lobbying power that companies will be able to come up with a way of saying, we've enabled the solution, we're sharing this, we're sharing this piece of data, we're sharing this piece of software, and they won't be sharing at all. And the core problem will go, will, will, will go on perpetuating itself. If, if we start to lean into a one-size-fits-all solution or even any kind of easy solution, because the, I think the core of the issue is gonna be very difficult to diagnose and it's gonna be very different in, in different industries. Actually, uh, Bethany, I find your, if you want, cultural interpretation very insightful and, and most likely right. The answer is that there, there is no one size fits it all. First of all, can be said for everything. But second, in fact, it is an argument in favor of antitrust and not regulation because regulation is one size fits it all. Antitrust can be more modulated if there is a strong principle behind And I think that the strong principle behind that he's making, look, we have invested too much in protecting property rights, but intellectual property rights have two sides. There is the incentive to accumulate them, and there are the benefits of diffusion. Even in the U.S. Constitution, when it comes to copyrights, it says clearly that you need to trade off the two. We've gone way too far in one direction. And it's pretty clear that you have to find the opposite direction. If uh, these property rights are a form of uh, monopoly, because after all, intellectual property is a monopoly. So it's a, it's a granted monopoly, but it's, it's a monopoly. And if you're saying we should fight against uh, the excessive use of that monopoly in order to promote more innovation, I think that uh, you can derive a pretty compelling agenda for antitrust if you want to. I, I, I agree with that. Doesn't a core part of the problem here go back to this innate belief we have that is turning out more and more to be wrong, which is that if a firm does something for its own economic benefit, somehow the fact that it benefits them economically does in and of itself diffuse to the rest to the rest of society, and that we need look no further than a firm maximizing its own, it's, it's a version of the Friedman-esque argument, that we need look no further than a firm maximizing its own bottom line profits, because therefore that is going to automatically lead to the, to the, to the right outcome for society. Society. And this is this is a interesting take on that on the, on that argument or another example of how that is not necessarily so, and that what a firm does in its own economic interest may actually be to the to the detriment of society in a very broad broad and big way. And so we need to think about things from a very conceptually different framework. And this is part of thinking about things from a very conceptually different framework. You said it very nicely. I think that the big dis- distinction is we're talking about innovation, which has some characteristic of a public good versus production of widgets or or any production of any other private private good. When uh, there is involvement of public good or semi-public good, because information is excludable, you know, the two characteristics of of a public good is that uh, generally it's not excludable and uh, it's not rivalrous in the sense that uh, you and I can have it together and my having it does not reduce yours. Now, information clearly fit the second c- criteria, doesn't fit the, the first one because you can retain information not share with me. So it is excludable. But the nature of non-rivalrous uh, of information and innovation is what determines the failure of many results of our standard economic analysis, including, of course, uh, Friedman and maximization, et cetera, et cetera. And this is why even the most conservative pro-free market individual concede that, for example, subsidizing innovation is a good idea. And subsidizing R&D, government subsidization of R&D is a good idea. That argument could be pushed forward. And certainly the part where he does insist and where I agree 110% 
is the fact that all these restrictions on uh, uh, limitation of movement of people and uh, non-compete clauses uh, and trade secret and all the stuff is really, really detrimental to society at large. And the ability to sue should uh, backfire because in some companies sue out of matter of policy whether before they even know that whether they have an argument. But, you know, if you are a young person, you leave to start your own firm, and I sue you, I destroy your startup because the venture capitalist, the first thing that he or she does is to check whether you have a pending suit. And if you have a pending suit from Microsoft, Intel, etc., they say, bye-bye, see you later. Whether there they is a merit or not merit, so at the very minimum, you should say that if I sue and I don't win, I owe you all the money I sue you for. So if I sue you for 100 million and then I can't win that case, I have to pay you 100 million. That would be a pretty good way to deter uh, this kind of suits. It does make me think that there's a really good follow on book from his book that would have to be done by some combination of an economist and an investigative journalist. But it, I, I believe that companies have probably long ago recognized this dynamic that he's writing about, whether they've recognized it implicitly or explicitly is, is, is an interesting question. But you, per your point, you think about how increasingly aggressive companies are around the movement of employees and the movement of, of, these, of this kind of information, that the policing of of that is one of the ways in which you see that companies have recognized this dynamic. I think another way in which you can see that they've recognized it is the way in which companies protect complexity. So I know at the most in the case of the big banks that I understand, but the arguments over um, disclosure of derivatives position has always been that's proprietary, that's a trade secret, other people could trade against us if we were to disclose that information in any more detail, all of which is some mixture of true and, and bull and I, I, you can see again that there's something to protect in how protective they are of, of, about it. So it, it would actually be really interesting to do a follow on book looking at the various ways in which companies have recognized this dynamic and moved aggressively to change the environment in ways that enable them to, to protect the very things that he says are at issue. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And maybe you should write that book. You seem to be highly qualified for that. But it's funny because you know that Intel was a spin-off from Felser Semiconductor. Basically, they de facto stole the wafer technology that was invented at Felser Semiconductor and sort of started at Intel. And because it takes one to know one, Intel sues the hell out of anybody who does anything coming out of Intel. So the reason why it sort of uh, is not possible to have this spin-off is because of this aggressive litigation system. And on, and on trade system, you probably know because you have studied the shale uh, oil industry, but what I read is that the combination of chemical agents that are used to extract shale oil, that are pumped in the, in the herd to extract shale oil, is a trade secret. And once an employee was literally showered by that, those ingredients to a point that I think it was a she. She was taken to the hospital and shivering and on the verge of death. And the doctor said, I need to know what you've been taking a shower with. Okay. So they called the company and the company initially said, no, it's a trade secret. I'm not going to reveal it. <laughs> Eventually was forced, but the, the person was almost dying as a result. So this kind of protection is, uh, is terrible. That I have not heard that story, but that encapsulates everything we're talking about. It's probably the most pointed example you could possibly have about corporate power and the lengths to which they'll go to keep these these things secret. But for, for sure, that protection is also, in this case, on an environmental basis, because if they were to disclose the exact cocktail of ingredients, then that would give the environmentalists mo most, most likely even more um, fuel, fuel to add to their, their fire, no pun intended or no oxymoronic yes. statement. <laughs> <laughs> intended something, some, something in that any, 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 anyway but there, but, there, but, there, but there is something in this that you can see in what corporations you can see that the accuracy of his argument in what we can tell about what corporations try so desperately to protect and I think that's there, there's an interesting nexus there now it's not because I'm trying suddenly to have an episode dedicated only on uh, Powell and the power memorandum but I think that uh, this subtle push, in favor of more enforcement of property rights, more patentable stuff, more this and more that, 
all started with a big push to our pro-business strategy at the beginning of the 70s. And it took a long time to be fully in effect, but that's exactly uh, the consequence of that movement. I do like this idea of thinking about the world through the lens of what are public goods and what public goods need to be diffused in order to keep our society, to keep our economy and our society on a track that we all that we all agree is, is for the best over the long term. And that leads to a very different set of outcomes or policies than thinking about the world from the standpoint of what will maximize a corp- an individual corporation's bottom line. And I think those are, it, it's... But, the, but this is, in a sense, should be the framework with which patent policy is developed. The reason why patent policy is designed the way it is, is because they say, we give you a monopoly, which is in general a bad thing, but we give you a monopoly. Number one as a temporary incentive to invest more. But number two, because you are sharing that information so that by the end of the monopoly period, everybody will use the same. So the example I heard made many, many times is the comparison between the Stradivarius uh, violin and the saxophone. Okay, The Stradivarius violin is not imitable. Why? Because Stradivarius did not have a patent system. And so he had the secret of his company died with him. And to these days, people have not been able to uh, replicate the study values. The saxophone is an instrument called by a guy called Mr. Sax, who got a patent and he made a bit of money until the patent was in place. But after the patent expired, everybody was able to produce saxophones according to a specific detail provided by Mr. Sax. Now, The question, and this is a bigger question that maybe we should analyze separately, is are we right on that trade-off and to what extent the trade-off is different across different areas? So in software, it might be very different than in pharmaceutical. Certainly in the last 20 or 30 years, lobbying has pushed us more and more in the direction of extending everything. There is a vested interest in extending all these rights as much as they can and milk every benefit, even when there are no incentive reasons. When, when they extend the copyright of work by Walt Disney, it's not creating incentives of Walt Disney to write more uh, stories because it's dead. Uh, but they still extract a lot of surplus from all the little kids that uh, have a balloon with a picture of Mickey Mouse. So I did not know the Stradivarius saxophone example, and I and I love that. That's really interesting. But I couldn't help thinking as you were talking when you mentioned pharmaceuticals that we've been trying for however many decades. Wasn't it 1970 that Hatch-Waxman was passed? We've been trying since nine, for 50 years to get the balance right in the pharmaceutical industry between the enforcement of patent rights and the public good of having lower cost drugs more, more broadly available. And we're still fighting that fight. And I don't think we've gotten anywhere very good, in part, part, in part because of a legal system that has enabled companies to game the patent system by coming up with all sorts of ways to extend the patent life of their, of, of, of their products. But it is a little bit of a caveat to what you're saying and what we're dis- discussing about property rights, that the attempt to strike this balance in pharmaceuticals, I don't know, maybe, it'd look, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you'd maybe it'd look at it more broadly and you'd say, we are striking a good balance. But I can't help looking at the past 50 years is just an absolute morass that has enabled lawyers to make an incredible amount of money on either on either side of the argument, while not necessarily doing the right thing for for, for consumers. Maybe maybe I'm being too negative. Maybe you could actually spin that around and say that the, the attempts to strike this balance in the pharmaceutical industry have been broadly successful, even if narrowly sort of miserable. I don't know whether we got it right. Certainly, the United States has a phenomenal capability in R and D in pharmaceutical. And that we have seen with the vaccine against COVID. And we should be thankful for that uh, for many, many dimensions. Now, whether we got that uh, trade-off right, I think uh, remains to be seen. And that's, that's part of the bigger discussion. Um, no, I think he's, he's very thoughtful in his a- analysis. And I am still a bit puzzled by the fact of why firms don't grow that fast. Because his argument is that our runner-ups don't grow that fast. And one interpretation is maybe they don't have space to grow. So so one of the arguments he makes, even if maybe not so explicitly, but is that once you have a very strong incumbent, the only way you can enter is by 
differentiating yourself in some dimension, maybe quality or others. If you have a very strong incumbent that is difficult to unseat, you're going to only specialize in niches of the market. And so your growth is, is very limited. So it is a, a very strong indictment of the fact that uh, this time seems to be different. When, when you talk to, to people about antitrust, they say, oh, but, uh, you know, IBM has come and gone and uh, Microsoft not gone, but it's certainly sort of gone down. And so why are you worried? Because technology will automatically produce a demise of the new firms. His argument seems to suggest that this is not that obvious, at least for now. Yeah, I love that. And I wonder, it would it would suggest an area for future research. I wonder if you were to look at at the way in which we talk about comp- new entrants entering a given industry, if we were would see that those new entrants are increasingly just pulling off, per your point, one little piece of the business where they might be able to challenge, but they can't challenge the whole thing because of this built-in dominance of of the lead firm that we've that we've been discussing. And so maybe you'd see that a new entrant isn't really a new entrant the way Walmart was a new entrant in the business of retailing next to Sears. You'd see that these new entrants Entrance. Instead, it's being broadly defined as a new entrant, but in reality, what they're doing is just pull, being able to pull off a little piece. Um, and maybe that's maybe that would be maybe that's part of the issue. Yeah, absolutely. Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also, check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to Capital Isn't wherever you get your podcasts.